Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I am the social studies specialist um, for the Maine Department of Education. Today, we are on episode two of this little webinar series talking about primary sources in Maine's history. Uh, this is done as a partnership and collaboration between the Maine Department of Education, the Maine Historical Society, the Maine State Archives, Maine State Museum, and the Maine State Library. Today we're going to be unveiling um, a new primary source set and to take you the rest of the way in the debut of this set, the tools, where to find them, how to use them. I would like the rest of the panel to introduce themselves, starting with Heather from the uh, State Archives. Hi, good afternoon. I am Heather Moran. I am the archivist, one of the archivists here at the Maine State Archives, and I'm delighted to be here with you. Um, my specialty is reference and um, in particular Civil War and early state records. So it's great to be here. Hi, I'm Allison Maxell. I'm the Director of Public and Outreach Services here at the Maine State Library. I'm pleased to say the Maine State Library is actually open now uh, and offering full service. We're basically nine to five, Monday through Friday at our new location, which is 242 State Street, which is essentially in the backyard of where we were um, at the cultural building. Um, we are in a much smaller footprint. There's only about 10% of our collections here um, with the remaining 90% at an offsite warehouse that's located in Winthrop. Um, all our materials, I'm pleased to say, are accessible or requestable, but what we're doing is we're encouraging patrons to call ahead to make sure the item is here in advance of your visit. Um, in terms of our collections, our primary focus is the acquisition of books and materials about Maine and by Maine authors with a strong nonfiction research emphasis. Uh, some of the examples of the materials um, that we have in our collections um, would include, uh, you know, state, county, town histories, town reports, newspapers, genealogies, government documents, maps, um, basically materials that provide comprehensive coverage of Maine history and government. Um, and then our online resources include our MSL um, catalog uh, that we share with the other academics in the state and uh, Bangor Public Library. Our digital main library has our online databases. The download library is our eBooks and audiobooks. And then Learning Express is more about career education and the digital main repository um, is a partnership with the archives and historical society and other people uh, that are digitizing records. Um, website is www.main.gov forward slash MSL forward slash. And I'm uh, pleased to be here and I hope uh, you'll avail yourself of all the resources that we have. Thank you, Allison. Um, I'm Joanna Toro. I'm the chief educator here at the Maine State Museum, and I'm joined by Kate Weber, who is also one of our lead educators. And um, we're thrilled to be here because um, the museum itself, there are exhibits, uh, our galleries are all closed to the public as the cultural building goes through its renovations. But of course, we're here virtually um, online with lots of materials uh, for everybody to explore. And uh, we're doing a lot of customized programming as well through Zoom and other online sources. So um, if you do want to visit any of that materials, and that's uh, mainstatemuseum.org. And um, today I really wanted to take just a moment and thank our uh, interns from Colby College that helped us with this uh, primary source project. Um, they're uh, Devin Berkeley and Stella Gonzalez. We couldn't have actually done as much work as we've done on this project without their hard work. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that they got recognized. Okay, I think we're ready for you, Kate. Great. Well, I'm going to start it out with um, a quick poll that I'm launching here just to give us get a sense of where we are. So if you could fill in what grade levels you teach. Um, do you use primary source materials in the classroom? And then the last question is, what's the biggest barrier for you in using primary sources? So just take a moment to fill that out, please.
All right, so it looks like our results are in here. Um, we've got uh, all grade levels covered uh, in the attendees today. Um, yes, sometimes we're using primary sources, so we'll kind of take that into mind. This is something that you're a little familiar with, but maybe don't do all the time. And then the last question, the biggest barrier uh, in using primary sources is, is a different one from what we've mentioned here. All right, so I'm gonna dive in here and I see, oh, there's something in the chat too. Oh, great, and education in a museum setting, great. All right, so I'm gonna start out by introducing um, the topic that we're talking about today and this brand new set of primary sources. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I've hopped into the museum's website here, the Maine State Museum's website. Um, and what you're gonna see here is our web page with a new set of primary source um, teacher materials. The theme for this topic is uh, freedom and captivity. And these are materials that investigate incarceration through historic images, documents, artifacts, and sound recordings. Um, and just to back up a little bit here, um, freedom and captivity is actually a statewide collaborative project so there are all different kinds of museums and libraries and historical societies and educational organizations um, and artists across the state of Maine who are partnering together um, on different exhibits and talks and documentaries and public works of art and all kinds of things talking about incarceration. So those are all going on um, right now. There was a kickoff event last week, so you can explore that website. We'll put the link in the chat later. Um, but that kind of prompted us to tackle this topic. And uh, as you can imagine, it was kind of a tricky topic to tackle. Um, we are aware of the fact that this is something people may or may not have personal connections to. They may or may not have um, political beliefs aligned to it. So we worked really hard to look for really compelling and interesting sources throughout Maine's history um, that talk about incarceration um, our primary source sets present those uh, items to students so that they can do the work of historians. Um, they can go in, they can investigate a source, um, they can think about what it is, uh, why it was designed that way, who made it, um, what audience it was made for, all of those media literacy questions. Um, they can think about it and analyze that source in a bigger picture. Um, so we're, we're hopefully opening the door for them to think about this tricky topic, um, the sensitive topic, in a new way. Um, we do also want to caution any educators who are tackling this topic just to have an awareness of your class's possible background with this topic. Um, it might not be possible to know whether or not they have a personal connection to anyone who's incarcerated, um, but probably a good rule of thumb is just to assume that that's the case for somebody in your class. Um, it's a nice rule of thumb anyway, just to make sure that you're approaching this material in a, in a humane way. You know, we're, we're sympathizing with people. All right, so we're going to look at the packets themselves. Um, these are designed for grade levels um, ranging from grade three to grade 12. Each packet includes a teacher guide, an introduction, uh, sets of primary sources. So we've got documents, artifacts, sound recordings, and images. And then analysis worksheets, which are an optional way to guide students through the process of working with primary sources. Um, so we know that the broader theme is freedom and captivity, but we've broken that up into four kind of sub themes, four big ideas. That is what kinds of people are in prison, life in prison, captivity outside of prison, and working in captivity. So if you scroll through the website here, there is a quick summary, um, an introduction to how the lessons work. Um, but if you click into our teacher guide, um, this gives a more detailed breakdown of what this would actually look like when you implement it in the classroom. So there is a um, summary of you know why, why use primary sources, which I'm sure if you're watching this, you've already bought in. Um, information on what the packets contain, um, set up the lesson format, and different options for how to work. Um, when we went out and prototyped this model in the classroom, um, which was, gosh, a couple years ago at this point now, <laughs> um, 
we uh, had versions that could work for students working individually with the primary sources, students working in small groups. Um, and also we uh, have options as well for if you're working with a class virtually, which obviously in the past year was a lot more relevant. Um, now people are coming back together again. Um, but yeah, these take you through and also some possible stumbling blocks that classes might run into. We have an additional resource list compiled as well. Um, this is a link to that statewide collaborative that I talked about. Um, and they also came up with a really handy timeline of incarceration in the United States. Um, this isn't a resource that we created, but it's one that we um, have linked to from that statewide collaborative. Um, it's gonna take a little bit of time to load, but we also have uh, resources to lesson plans and information from other organizations like Learning for Justice, the Smithsonian, um, and since some of our materials deal with the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we have an article to give you a little bit of context on that as well. Um, one tip that actually I got from Joe, I think last year or the year before, there's a great website called Rewordify. So if you're working with primary source documents and the language is a little antiquated, it doesn't really um, connect with your class, you can copy and paste the text into Re uh, Rewordify and it will kind of translate that into something that'll be easier for your students to understand. And I'll just give you a quick preview of that timeline. There's an overview here and they also um, uh, focus on um, main history as well. All right, so the packets themselves, um, we've scrolled down through the website and we've got these four bigger themes that we talked about. We have what kinds of people are in prison, life in prison, captivity outside of prison, and working in captivity. Um, just to give you a quick overview, um, what kinds of people are in prison, um, these Sources are just kind of snapshots of um, different uh, angles of how people could end up incarcerated um, and as opposed to life in prison, which focuses more on what the experience and conditions are there. Captivity outside of prison looks at some alternate forms um, aside from traditional prisons and jails. So in this case, we focused in on Maine's history of prisoner of war camps during World War II and um, the history of boarding schools where indigenous children were, were placed um, mostly in the uh, late 1800s up through mid 1900s. Um, so those are the two forms of kind of alternate, like they're not people in actual jails and prisons, but there are parallels that we encourage students to explore. And then finally, working in captivity is about labor. Um, so if you wanted to know what is actually entailed in each of these packets, um, they start out with a standards alignment. So you can see where these materials um, broken apart by grade level fit in with main learning results and common core standards. It's a little different for the different grade levels because um, you know, they, they include different sources. So students may be doing more or less reading or um, looking at images, things like that. Um, so a sample of what an introduction includes. Uh, we designed these introductions really with the goal of giving teachers the information that they need to know so they can feel comfortable standing up in front of their class and presenting this material. Um, so it's providing a little bit of context to these complicated nuanced subjects. Um, so in this case, you know, working in captivity talks about uh, prison labor more generally um, these sources are going to talk about both traditional prisons, prisoners of war, and then the boarding schools that we talked about uh, that I mentioned earlier. So it gives the context that students might need before they can approach those subjects. Um, then there's the actual lesson breakdown. This isn't quite as detailed as that teacher guide, but it's a basic step-by-step -step that takes you down through, okay, well, first you might want to present this to your class. Um, so in this case, we recommend for these materials that uh, teachers share some of the introductory information with their students. Um, that could be done in advance as a homework assignment, you know, some reading for the students to go through so they come in prepared. It might be something that you just kick off the class with, reading it together, um, particularly this is a third to fifth grade 
group. Um, so you obviously don't want them to have to read too much on their own. So that would be something you could go through together as a class. Um, the students would choose a primary source to work with. And the important um, way that these kits work is that the student is just seeing the primary source. They are not finding out what it is that they're looking at until later. Um, so I'll give you an example of that now. If we are in the primary sources for the theme of labor, you would get um, a picture. In this case, this is kind of a, a magazine cut out here with some pictures and the caption. So the students um, have to pull all of the information, all of their analysis and observations from what they're looking at, whether that's an image, in this case, a historic document. Um, we have another um, few images here, a newspaper article um, and an artifact. So this is something that can be a challenge to students. You know, it can be hard to look at a physical object and try to get information about what this is, why we're talking about it, how it connects to the theme. Um, so we have analysis worksheets that draw them through those steps. So in that case, if we were doing an artifact, um, rather than just have to come up with what they know about it, these analysis worksheets are an option to check off, okay, well, you know, does it look like it's decorative or utilitarian? Is it beat up? Are there um, smooth surfaces? It, this has some wood and some leather in it. So it guides them through some basic analysis and observation work to the point where they're getting more and more information from it as they go along. All right, so getting back to the introduction, um, they're looking at the sources um, they talk about it as a class. Um, it's great, you know, we often ask, well, what surprised you? What do you think this has to do with a theme? Um, really get them thinking about, about these sources and what they've learned just with their own powers of observation. Um, and then after all of that reflection and conversation happens, they actually get the um, kind of the, the answer sheets, they get the labels. So you're going through, them and for that first image we saw okay well this is these are a series of photographs from around 1895 and um, this is what they were from this is what they're doing um, that document was from a 1920 biennial report so this is something that the main state archives has in their collection and pulling out some of the key information about it um, all the way down to that artifact that we saw which is a sleigh that's part of the Maine State Museum's collection, and it was made around 1900 at the Maine State Prison. Um, so, and there's a little bit of information in here about labor at the prison and how there were um, shops with carriage making and cabinet making and, and skills like that that were taught. So that's a rough um, run through of what you're going to find on the website. Obviously, each theme is broken down into the standards. Um, our major grade levels here. Um, of course, we design these to be flexible. If you have a sixth grade class that's maybe not as comfortable with reading, you're welcome to use um, the uh, lower level here. The same thing if you have fifth graders who are just really eager to learn more about the subject, you could hop up um, to a later level. Uh, you'll find that it scaffolds a little bit. So what you find in the third to fifth grade level, you'll also find in the six to eight and the nine to 12, but we build on it with um, a little bit more complexity, um, sometimes material that's a little bit tough, tougher to tackle for younger audiences. So it's broken apart by grade level as well. Um, just logistically, if we're looking at one of these lessons, um, there are some different ways you can approach the materials. Um, we talked a little bit about how this can work both in person and virtually. Um, it can work in small groups or as individual work. Um, so we also recognize that the analysis worksheets that you see here might not be the approach that everyone wants to take as well. Um, I have found just in the um, past couple of years since we started working on this model that our um, sources 
uh, work really well too with other teaching techniques. Um, so if you're familiar at all with the QFT method, which is um, question formulation technique, um, this is something that can be great with your students. You can put this image up in front of them or print it out and have that in front of them and ask them to come up with as many questions as they can, um, refine that list as a class. Uh, there are all kinds of creative ways that you can use these material, materials, and we want to um, let people know they have the permission to take these core materials and make them work for their class as well. All right, so I know I've been talking for a long time, so I'm going to hop out of the share for a minute. And uh, we are going to have the chance now to kind of play around with this together. Uh, this up for a minute, get to poll number two. All right, and everybody can vote on this. Um, what of the, which of the four themes would we like to explore together today? All right, so excellent choice. We are going to look at captivity outside of prison. Great. Oh yeah, Joe noted in the chat, host can't vote. Well, <laughs> sorry everybody else, I got your hopes up by saying you could vote, but we're just gonna go with captivity outside of prison. All right, so I'm gonna bring up my screen share again in a minute. Um, but we are going to approach this um, kind of a little bit, a little bit of a, a role play here thing, thing here. We're going to um, set it up so I'll walk through the materials in an abbreviated way as though you're a class that I'm presenting this to and you'll all get the chance to submit responses. Um, Joanna has volunteered to bring up an analysis worksheet. So when we get to that point, um, we'll have a chance to do that, but I would encourage all of you, um, once I go through the introductory materials, uh, feel free if you're comfortable to unmute and we can kind of have a little bit of a conversation as though we were a class. So be ready for that. It won't be just yet, but I'm going to hop into my screen share. Okay, so we are captivity outside of prison. Um, I know that uh, we've got representation from all the grade levels, so I'm going to just treat myself and do 9 to 12 because I love the variety of sources that we get with the older classes. It kind of gives a little bit more to choose from, which I think is fun. So, Captivity outside of prison. All right. Okay, class. <laughs> uh, well, we start out actually first with a um, content warning again to our teachers. Um, this is both for them and having awareness of their class. Um, Captivity Outside of Prison also has some things to look out for as well. Um, these materials do cover um, some top topics of violence. Obviously we're talking about prisoners of war. So if there are um, kids who have family members who are veterans or you know actively serving, that's something that we might wanna look out for. Um, and also there is some childhood trauma mentioned around the indigenous boarding schools. Um, so that's something to uh, approach carefully as well. Okay, so in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at primary sources from different time periods to investigate two forms of captivity that are different from traditional jails and prisons. Um, just a note to uh, both teachers and students, I know it can be confusing um, and difficult to figure out, well, what name am I using when talking about Indigenous people? Um, a lot of the school standards are going to talk about Native American history, um, Indigenous Peoples Day that we're celebrating next month, um, getting up, we're so close to the border with Canada, people may prefer First Nations. Um, and there's also the term Indian that we're going to see a lot in these documents. Um, it's still used in US federal law and policies. Um, so that term is still very much out there and some people prefer it. Um, so the general rule of thumb is to be as specific as possible. If you're talking about a Passamaquoddy person, say Passamaquoddy. If you're talking about Wabanaki, say um, you know, Wabanaki a little bit more generally. 
Um, but here we've kind of used a mixture of terms because um, different folks uh, prefer different terminology. But that could be something that throws your students off. So we wanted to lead off with that. Okay, so the land we now know is Maine is Wabanaki homeland. And Native Americans have lived here for thousands of years and still live here today. The Wabanaki or people of the dawn include the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians, the Penobscot Nation, the Passamaquoddy Tribe, and the Aroostook Band of Micmacs. And there are also um, Abenaki people living here and people connected to tribes from other areas. So this introduction talks a little bit about um, European colonists first arriving here um, and viewing indigenous people as uncivilized, um, maybe a threat to Euro-American success and progress. It talks about um, people creating homes here and colonies in this new place, uh, what that process entails. Um, there are very visible, obvious ways like where warfare and taking of land, and there are quieter ways that that operates, which is what we're talking about more in this lesson, um, which involves assimilation, you know, forcing indigenous people to change their religion, language, and culture to fit a new society. Um, this is also something that has ongoing repercussions lasting into the present day. So um, this is kind of an active, active history that's shaping Maine today. Um, there's a quote here from Donna Loring. Education has been a two-edged sword for Native people. On the one hand, it has opened opportunities. On the other, it has harmed us physically, psychologically, and spiritually. It inflicted spiritual wounds upon Native people lasting for generations. We call these wounds soul wounds. Um, so this is transitioning into the story of Indian boarding schools, also known as residential schools, which were built in the late 1800s with a goal of teaching Native children to blend into the rest of society. Um, so there's an introduction on what boarding schools are. That might not be a, a term that your students are familiar with. Um, you know, they're not with their families. They're living in a different place. They're eating there. They're playing there. They're working there. They're learning there. Um, and the goals behind the boarding schools. Um, so this uh, is a very troubled history that I know has been coming up more in the news lately. Um, it's a very timely moment to be talking about this with your class, um, even though it is a difficult thing to talk about. Uh, so at these schools, um, children were taken from or sent by their families to live and learn. Um, usually for years, they were forced to change the way they dressed, cut their hair. Um, typically, they weren't allowed to speak their native languages or practice traditional religions. And unfortunately, students were very often, um, often abused by their teachers there. And many dealt with that trauma for the rest of their lives. Um, it, let's see, so since they live near the border of the United States and Canada, Wabanaki children were sent to schools in both countries. Many children never returned to their home communities after leaving school. Families were split apart. Some returned home, but felt like they were no longer connected to their culture. So that is um, an example of an introduction. You know, you, may, you can decide how much of that you want to share with your class and in what manner you want to share it with your class. Um, some background is important as you're approaching these topics, um, but it could also be a thing where you want students to explore and inquire, um, do their own research as well. All right, so that's one side of our captivity outside of prison theme. The other is uh, on Maine's World War II prisoner of war camps. During World War II, German soldiers were captured by the United States military, and rather than let them go free and continue to help the military, um, the U.S. transported them to America as prisoners of war, the POWs. Over 370,000 German POWs were held in 500 camps across the United States. Um, and then this introduction talks more about what that meant in Maine. So um, Camp Holton in Aroostook County had 3,500 POWs from 1944 to 1946. Um, there were different branches of that in different parts of the state. They were usually isolated by woods and water. Um, and a connection to the previous, the other part of this theme is that some of those camps were on Wabanaki land that had been claimed by the state as well. Um, so according to um, accounts that seem to be reputable from both the POWs themselves, um, local people, the Red Cross, uh, treatment was pretty good at these camps. Um, some of the POWs formed friendships with local farming families because they were out in the communities um, harvesting potatoes, cutting ice, cutting trees. 
um, our uh, working in captivity theme goes into that history a little bit more. Um, but and so we know that they formed some relationships and after the war, uh, some of those POWs actually moved to the United States and some of them came back to Maine for visits. So there's an indication that um, these were in many cases livable con conditions for people. Um, we know there are strict rules in the Geneva Connect, uh, Convention for how POWs can be treated. Um, however, prison is prison. Um, you'll learn some more in this uh, theme about how some POWs did still uh, escape. They fought for their freedom um, and some kind of contrasting images of what camp life was like. Uh, okay, so we've gone through the introduction. Uh, we already talked about the rundown of a lesson before, and I'm not going to get into the optional activities just yet. So we uh, this class has just been presented with some basic introductory materials about Maine prisoner of war camps and about boarding schools. Um, so now we're going into our primary sources. Um, what Joanna and I and Heather and I um, ended up doing pretty frequently when we went out into the classroom is we printed off um, this stack of sources. Um, this is a particularly long one because we've got two different topics that we're covering. Um, so there are nine different sources in this. Most of them are, um, for the lower levels, often just three sources. Um, but so we would print off all of these pages, plop them down in a group of tables, and let the students choose which source they wanted to work with, um, because we find that it gives them a little bit more agency, a little bit more ownership over the project. Um, some of them love, you know, the artifacts. Some of them love images, believe it or not. Some of them like a document. Um, so we're uh, giving different, uh, different ways for them to choose what they want to look at. But um, this is the point where I'd like you folks to unmute and you get to choose. Okay, so let's say I just plopped down this printed stack of papers in front of you. I'm just going to quickly scan through the sources so you can see what they are and decide which one you want to look at together. Oh, this one has a sound recording as well. All right. We could narrow it down to start with, do people want to work with an artifact, sound recording, or photo, or a document? I'll try an artifact. Say artifact. Artifact, all right. So that narrows it down then to this source right here. Let me see if I can get that a little bit bigger for people. OK. So this is, all we know is that it's source number five. We know it's an artifact. This is what we're looking at. So I'm going to keep this up on the screen. Um, Joanna, if you are able to go into the worksheet for an artifact, um, yeah. and maybe you can, you don't have, we don't have to fill it out line by line, but if you could just prompt us with a few questions, that would be appreciated. Great. So um, our artifact um, worksheet starts with what colors do you see? So for that, this image, I think that's pretty limited. So we can start with that. People just want to shout them out. Yellows, brown. Okay. Goes down. And this is a fillable PDF, um, which also is something that we did to, to make sure that students, if they were working remotely, that this is pretty easy to do. So our next question um, is, how does it look? And we've kind of given them some, some ways of thinking about this. Is it worn, beat up, or used? Or it looks like it's been used a lot. Is it new, um, uh, maybe been carefully protected to preserve it? And then the third choice is um, made to be used. So it's utilitarian. It's an item that people work with. And then the last choice, made to be seen. So it's something that is really decorative and has less of, of a, a work purpose, a purpose to be used. So what do we think? Is it worn? Is it new? Is it utilitarian? Or is it decorative? 
I'd say used and worn. Used and worn. Okay. And um, what does it feel like? Is it heavy, light, smooth, rough? Is the surface look kind of hard or is it super soft and squishy? Any ideas about what it would look like? Definitely like hard. Heavy and hard. <laughs> heavy and hard, okay. And rough. And rough, got that. And then the last um, kind of of this section here, we're asking what's made out of, you know, and we're giving them some prompts about common things that would be made out of metal, fabric, ceramic, pottery, wood, leather, stone, glass, paper, plastic, bone, and others. So what do we see over here um, of how this is constructive and what materials is it made out of? So wood. That wood. Leather. And leather. I see some metal. It looks like some metal as well. Yeah. Um, and then the next session, um, what we ask students to do is, what three words would you use to describe this artifact? Um, so that would be one thing. And then we're also asking them to like really look a little bit closer and see, is there anything written on this? And if, it, if there is, because often kids, we, we have a no or yes question. And then we say, if something's written on it, please tell us what it is. Because oftentimes they will start, you know, they just stop at that yes. And then, well, well what is it? <laughs> um, so how would you, what are some words that you guys would use to, to um, describe these objects? Looks homemade, like hand constructed. It's adjustable, whatever it is. Okay, is there anything written on it? No, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, I don't see it either. So we'll just say no and I'll show you. Um, what, what this looks like filled out um, in a minute, um, but we've just done the first page. And then there's a second page. Usually these are back to front. Um, and this goes about a little bit deeper. So you're asking the students, um, do you know who made this artifact? And yes, it, you know, tell us who it was and no, you know, we ask them to, to not just say no, but you know, is it, it might be made by this type of person. What kind of person might be making this or might've owned it? So do we know who made this artifact? No, no signature. Maybe by a carpenter? A great guess. Since it's made out of wood. Okay, and then we do, if we don't know who, who perhaps made it, it might've been made by a carpenter. Do we know who used this artifact? Who, who, is there anything in that picture on this object, of this object that can give us a clue of who might have used it? And if it, we do know that, who might have been? And if we don't, if we want to say no, we don't know, can we give a guess of who might have used it? So it's probably someone without much money because they're not very fancy looking. <laughs> can't spell someone. Okay. And kind of going back over what we've like, the kind of questions we've answered. So we know it's kind of worn. We know it's kind of something that was made to be used. It was rough and perhaps heavy and hard. It's made out of leather, wood, uh, some kind of metal materials. Definitely looks homemade. Seems like there's um, ways you can adjust it. There's nothing written on it. Um, no signature to kind of definitely tell us who made it, but it might've been a carpenter. And it's, it's definitely not fancy. So maybe this is somebody who is using this that doesn't have a lot of money. So knowing all of those facts that we've now put together, how would you guess this item was used and for what for? It looks like something you'd strap on your feet. 
I was thinking maybe like a splint. Okay. They look kind of like a really rustic form of a snowshoe or something, maybe to get a go over across the ice or. Okay. And the last, the next question, and actually not the last, second to last question, um, does the artifact remind you of anything that people use today? And Allison, um, you sort of <laughs> kind of oh, gave sorry. us that one. <laughs> no, that's fine, because that's what happens, right? You're getting that information and you're putting some things together and sometimes you get there quicker. Um, and uh, the, the, the second part of that question is, um, how is this different than what people would use today? So if that was a sort of um, a snowshoe, how is it different than snowshoes that we have? Um, well, even some of the earlier snowshoes um, had kind of a, like a nylon gut kind of material. So these look particularly heavy to me. <laughs> um, it was more of a webbing. Usually there's more of a webbing, like there's a structure to a snowshoe, but um, it looks like maybe the foot slid in to the leather, but maybe the metal is holding it in place around the ankle. Mm -hmm. That's what no it looks like to me, like a simple piece of wire just to hold your heel in. Yeah. Okay. It's very uncomfortable. Hard, hard to walk in. <laughs> <laughs> kind of awkward, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the last piece of this is at you know asking um, our students to take a moment to review what you know about this artifact and now what can you tell about the artifact? Um, no, sorry, sorry. Let me say that again. Um, what can you, what can the artifact tell you about the period of history in which it was made and used? So. Any ideas how to answer that? Maybe there were limited resources. I mean, look at one of it and it looks like it's just a stick. Um, mm -hmm. The others seem to be more carved, but so limit, limited materials available. Um, okay. Looks like handmade nails. Great. Okay, you guys did great. I thought that, um, Kate, I, if you wanna stop sharing, I can share my screen and just show you what this looked like filled out. Okay, so you can see this is the first page of this. Um, so we've kind of been able to kind of click through um, what these felt like, what is it made out of? Here's our words describing it, checking in that there's something written on it. Then we have a page two. So it's, even though these are two pages, they're, they're not asking huge amounts of information and they're, they're moving pretty quickly. We tried to organize it visually so that it was easy for a variety of students to, to go through and stay engaged. Um, and so we were able to type right in there who um, might've made it and who might've used it and put all our answers in there. And this is great for um, kind of getting to just the kids thinking about what they're we're looking at a little bit more closer observation. And then also having something that they can use when they go on to discuss it with other students and, and um, the rest of the class. So it kind of gives them something to refer to and hopefully it will give them a, make them a little bit more confident um, in, in talking in, and looking at the object. And stop sharing with that one. Okay. Thank you, Joanna. All right, so I'm going to hop back into our form here. And so this is one of my favorite parts of this activity, especially when we got to be in the classroom doing this, is that if you have a table spread out with these, these different sources, um, you've got one student who's been spending a bunch of time looking at this one artifact. And then once they finish up, they might kind of peek over their shoulder to see what the person next to them is working at. And they might see, um, recognize, like, wait a minute, this, this other source has my artifact in it. <laughs> or they might be looking around at the other things to think, well, what on earth is 
is going on here? Um, what are these stories? So I think to kind of replicate that a little bit, um, let's do one more source. Um, I want to stick with, um, this is divided up, the um, boarding school material is sort of one through four here, and the um, POW camp are the last five. So I'm going to stick in the POW camp um, range, but uh, would you, let's see, between six, seven, eight, and nine, which source would we like to talk about next? Nine. Nine, all right, great. Um, and we don't have to do the full worksheet here. Um, maybe Joanna, if you could just talk us through kind of an abbreviated. Sure, um, we can do that. that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so now we're, we're looking at an image. So do we know what kind of image this is? Is it a um, painting? Is it a photograph? Uh, is it a print? What do we think we're working with? I think that's always a good thing to, to start with. Is it a drawing, a cartoon, a map? What do we have here? Looks like a photograph to me. Yeah. I we can check that then. And then usually what we would go over is ask them about color. Is this black and white? If it's a color, can you can, can you go into it to more to more fun, some more for us? Sorry, couldn't get that out. Um, and this this looks kind of like a sepia print, but it's really just two tones. So I'm gonna say that that is black and white. And um, you know, and then we're asking the kids, what are things that you notice? Um, if there's a person there, let's describe that person. If there's um, buildings there, are there animals, are there plants, are there man-made objects? You know, think about what's there and then describe what's happening. Um, so maybe that's the one that we should go after um, next. What, what kind of activities or actions or what do we see in this picture? I see barbed wire. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have barbed wire. What else do we see? Buildings that look like like barracks, like prison barracks. Yeah, so we have barbed wire here and we've got these kind of long prison, perhaps prison barracks, these kind of long buildings right here. Anything else? I can't tell this might be a person in the where my mm -hmm. arrow is here. Yeah, definitely looks, uh, that blob looks like it could be person-like. <laughs> so we have a person kind of in the middle um, or maybe at an entrance uh, along this, the long line of wire, um, fenced in, and then these barracks. Um, is there anything else in the environment or the landscape that we want to note? In a cold, it looks it's winter time. Right. So when we first look at this, we're looking that we have perhaps a person, we have buildings, we have fences that um, look like they have barbed wire on them. And it, it looks like kind of a wintry, cold, snowy um, environment. Okay. It's so dark and unwelcoming. Yes. Does not look friendly. So that would kind of take us to this, the first page. And then we have the second page, which is asking things like, do we know when it was created? And if we don't kind of take a guess around the, what time of year or the period of time. And then we want the students to kind of look a little bit deeper and see if there's a caption or a title, any kind of writing on there and, and to write that down. Um, you know, if we know who created the image, is there a signature? Is there a stamp by a maker? And if they don't, what kind of person might have made this? Um, and then also we're asking about location. You know, where is this located or where was it made? Do we know what the place is? And if we don't, um, what, uh, you know, think about where it could have been um, taken, this image taken or depicted of. Um, and then we're at the very end, uh, we're gonna say, take a moment to review what you've learned after going through those questions and looking closely at this image and tell us um, what can you tell about the time period in which it was created? So that's giving you an idea of how that worksheet 
works. So kind of going through knowing this is a photograph, it's black and white. Um, we've identified that there's perhaps a person there. We've talked about the kind of buildings, man-made objects, a little bit about the environment. We didn't really do much with actions because there it doesn't seem to have much of that. You know, we're not getting any clues about when it was made exactly. There's no date on there. There's no written description or signature of who made it, um, and no caption. So we're we does does look like there is electricity, so that may be an indication into the time period. Um, and it looks like sure. it, yeah. Looks like there's a truck way in the background. So 20th century, maybe. Yeah. So they look all fire right. hydrants. Yep. Yeah. Right up oh, here. yeah. <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> oh, I've never noticed that before. Yeah. If I can zoom in a little. Wow. <laughs> Good eye. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, maybe some more action happening back Diesel. here too. It's funny now that you make it larger, I can see the the smoke coming out of some of those little smokestacks in the buildings too. Right. Yeah, it makes me even feel like this was super cold. <laughs> and you can cold. tell some of the trees have lost their leaves here. So if we didn't have the snow for a clue about the time of year, you'd see that. And it looks like there are pine trees, you know, ever, mm -hmm. evergreens. Yeah. yeah. So you can see that this method really gets you to look closely. And I think the kids are really like, you know, finding the fire hydrant. Everybody's like, they're, they're, they're pretty pleased when they find these details that you, maybe the, the adults haven't noticed. Um, that was always fun to hear them it kind of boost their confidence um, quite a bit as well. Uh, so, and, and the, it's really, that's what it's about is, is those really good observations and then putting those pieces together to really talk about what, what is this telling us about a time and a moment in time, right? Um, and the worksheet's there just to guide them to make sure that they don't get stuck. Cause that's what we found a lot that kids would be like, you know, they'd be like, no, I, I don't know. And they would get really stuck. Um, images are maybe a little bit easier, uh, but certainly documents or objects um, were pretty challenging and we wanted to make sure that we were giving them something that would keep them going and not shut them down if they had one part that was frustrating. All right, well, thank you, Joanna. Um, so now that we've had the chance to look closely at a few of these, um, one, one thing that's really fun as a class discussion is if students have been working um, in smaller groups or on their own looking at sources, coming together as a class to try to fit some of these pieces together is, uh, is really great because you can, um, you can really have them develop their theories about what's going on and what the connection is. Um, so in this theme, we've got, um, we just looked at this picture in detail. One thing I really loved is the contrast between this picture and this beautiful, colorful painting here. I'll just give you a minute to look at that. Um, we have this image of a man. We have <coughs> this image here. And we've already looked at the snowshoes. Um, and I won't explore these first four in as much detail, but on the boarding school side of it, we have this photograph. This photograph. There's an excerpt from a speech. And this is an audio recording. So which I realized one thing I should do is make sure to hyperlink that better. But in the meantime, you can um, if you click on that link, it'll take you to the slowly loading audio clip. Oh no. All right, well, I'll figure that out. Um, an audio clip there. 
And that audio clip has a transcription, right? Yes. Yeah. So you can also read the words either as you go along or if the audio clip doesn't work in addition uh, instead of that. Oh, this um, one set really does show you the variety that we try to put in there with audio, uh, the, obviously the audio being something that's new to us, but I think for, for students that um, might struggle with a, a document, that's a really great art alternative. All right, so we've had the chance to look at um, all of these sources and now I'm going to pull up the labels. So this is kind of a, I always try to be really dramatic with the students. Like, oh, you could just figure out what it is now. So exciting um, to hand out the answers. So the ones that we looked at, let's see how close we got. Uh, we looked at this artifact. Okay, so these are snowshoes. We got the guess right. Um, they were made around 1944, 1945. Um, so here's, I'll read out the label. In the winter of 1945, three German soldiers tried to escape from the prisoner of war camp at Spencer Lake, Maine. One of the three made these snowshoes to help escape. The man traveled through the forest wearing these shoes, but was eventually caught and returned to camp. Camp Spencer Lake held more than 1,100 German soldiers during World War II. A prisoner of war is a person held captive by their enemy during an ongoing war and conflict. Unlike other prisons that hold a country's own citizens, camps like, like Spencer Lake were meant to keep enemy soldiers from participating in the war. Pay attention to the type of materials used in these snowshoes. Think about how the prisoners adapted to the environmental conditions of Maine. Notice how crude and rough they look. The prisoners of war spent weeks gathering materials from different places to create these snowshoes. They stole wood from fencing and farming projects. They took leather from the belts that were a part of their prison uniforms. Even though their escape failed, they were still able to use the snowshoes to travel miles in the snowy forest. So this source pairs pretty well with that image we saw um, of one of the wardens of the prisoner of war camp who um, with some other guards tracked down um, the three escaped soldiers and brought them to camp. So he, he looks a little bit smug here because he did his job and, and got them got them back again. Um, I think it adds a night as well um, because we looked at what the camp is and what it might be like to try to escape from a place like this. Um, I'll pull up the label for that final photograph. Um, this was 1945, a photograph of Camp Holton. Um, so this wasn't Spencer Lake, but it was one of the um, other camps nearby. Uh, well, not nearby, but also in Aroostook County. Um, you, we've noted the tall fencing with barbed wire. There were machine gun posts, which I can't visually recognize in here, but um, maybe some of you can, but they were very heavily guarded. Um, it, they fences both keep, kept prisoners from escaping and kept unwanted visitors out of the camp. Um, and the museum that, don't, that um, let us use this, Arista County Historical and Art Museum up in Holton, um, gave us permission to use these sources, uh, noted that this is a really rare image to have because it was strictly forbidden to take pictures of prisoner of war camps. Um, so that's something fun for students to think about when we're thinking about, well, who took this photo? It probably was not an authorized um, you know, the warden or a guard at the camp necessarily, maybe a local person kind of snuck up and got it. Um, but it's a rare view to have of this period in America's history and Maine's history. Um, I really like the contrast between this view here of Camp Holton and this painting of Camp Holton. Let me make this a little smaller so you can see all of it. Um, so one of the German prisoner of wars at Camp Holton painted this scene, um, which I think it was Heather who noted how dark and foreboding that picture was. You get a totally different idea of the place if you see this kind of idyllic, beautiful landscape with the flowers in the front, kind of a cozy looking building. Um, you know, the prisoner maybe had reasons for painting it this way. Maybe he wanted fond memories or had fond memories, or maybe it was a way to kind of grapple with 
um, being so far from home in captivity. Um, but we know that, um, I'll pull up the source label, we know that um, this camp did have recreation time, including a dedicated room for uh, activities like painting. So that tells us a bit about life there too. Um, you know, yes, they're in prison, but also um, recreation was encouraged. They were going off to farm and um, do other activities. You know, life and culture um, relationships clearly continued for people, um, which may be a contrast to uh, what we see in other forms of the prison. Um, and then finally, we have a portrait of one of the prisoners. Um, this is Gerhard Kleint, um, a photograph from 1944. Um, one thing to note here is that the P identified prisoners, um, but apart from that, he, this is actually, you know, it doesn't seem like somebody who's living in maybe the condition I at least would have come in thinking about um, when I when I think about a prisoner of war camp. Um, of course, you know, this could have been carefully posed, you know, maybe he uh, was um, given a little bit of special treatment to look nice before it was taken. I don't know the story behind it, but that also um, gives a sense of the life here. All right, and then I'll just quickly run through um, if we had gone in the direction of the first four sources. Um, that first image that we saw is a before and after picture of Thomas More from the Carlisle Indian School. Um, Carlisle was in Pennsylvania, so you might wonder why we're including it in our main base um, history lesson here, but we know that Wabanaki children were sent to um, Carlisle as well as to um, institutions, um, residential schools up across the Canadian border as well. Um, they have lists of the surnames of students there. Um, and folks have pulled out Wabanaki names from that. Um, there's also, you know, this wasn't actually that long ago when you think about it, especially since some of these schools went on up into the 1900s. So it's the kind of thing that lives on in um, current memory for people. But there's, yeah, the same boy, um, a before and after photo that would have been used for marketing purposes at the time, you know, to show what a great job, um, quote unquote, great job the schools were doing. Um, of, of achieving their goals. Um, this picture uh, is also from Carlisle and it really just shows a scale of how many kids, um, how old they were, what they were expected to look like and dress like and um, how they positioned themselves and where they were living. Uh, this speech here is from Captain Richard Pratt, who was the founder of this school. Um, Carlisle was the first federally funded uh, boarding school. And this speech is famously known as um, the kill the Indian, save the man speech, because Pratt was advocating for, um, you know, killing the culture, the language, the religion, the practices of people is a way to save them, to improve them, to make their lives better. Um, so here's the, the quote you can see in this first line, kill the Indian and him and save the man, um, which is something students may have heard from other lessons before. But he goes into some more detail about his vision. Um, so these are his own words about um, why this is his life's work and what the Carlisle School is supposed to accomplish. Uh, and then this resource is especially powerful when paired with um, the audio recording, um, which I will make sure tonight, I'll go back and make sure that this link works again. I might've just copied and pasted it wrong. Um, but this is an audio clip from a woman in Maine, um, Miku Paul. So pull up the label here. Um, so Miku was interviewed in 2014. Um, she grew up near the Penobscot Indian Island Reservation near Old Town, Maine, and she's actually a member of the Kingsclear First Nation in New Brunswick. Um, and her grandfather helped raise her, and he was sent as a kid to um, one of the residential schools. And she talks in really powerful and heartbreaking language about what this did to her family and what it continues to do to her family today. Um, this is part of a, this recording was made as part of a broader project. The um, Maine Wabanaki 
Child Welfare, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, so these interviews were done um, to talk about um, uh, ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act, and um, you know, foster care and impact on families, but um, boarding schools do enter into that story. Um, so this, this clip uh, was a way for us to bring in the personal connections um, to, you know, uh, the, the picture of Thomas Moore that we saw in the beginning, you know, maybe, maybe that child went back to his family and had a similar story to what we hear from Miku. Um, anyway, so that's what we've got from our alternate forms of captivity source list. All right, I'm gonna pause for a minute just to take a breath and check in with all of you to see if anybody has any questions at this point, um, anything that's come up so far. Okay, so we have, um, Oh, yeah, and there's a note in the chat from Joe about how images help level the playing field with reading ability. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. Um, we have found in developing these, um, we've kept for the most part the documents uh, to the older. We've mostly excluded those to the older um, grade levels because it's uh, a powerful thing to be able to just analyze a picture. Um, that was an important thing for us to include. All right, so I think maybe what we'll do next, because my favorite part anyway is playing around with these things. Um, I'd like to just dip our toes in the other sources a little bit. Uh, we've got, we already looked through working in captivity briefly, um, but just to give you a quick sense, um, now that we've done one of these in more detail, Um, this picture uh, might have a little bit more impact now that we have already talked about the boarding schools. Um, so part of that program at Carlisle was after students had been there for a couple of years, they would be sent out to farms and homes in the community to do work there. Um, again, with the goal of, you know, teaching them to live and work more like the white families in the area. Um, juvenile institutions of Maine are another uh, history that's very much coming up into the present day and is in the news. Um, questions about that. So this is a report talking about girls um, similar to this source here. They are being placed in families in the community um, doing domestic work, um, with the families, they're earning some wages uh, that come back to the school, they get to keep some of them. Um, and this is kind of a condition of parole for girls who are at this institution. Um, this photograph shows uh, brooms. Let me see if I can zoom in more. So this is a load of brooms headed off to be sold, um, the main state prison in Thomaston is one that we'll hear a lot about in the other two sources. So I won't go into too much more detail there, but um, just like the sleigh that we looked at earlier, these brooms were made by incarcerated people in the workshop um, and they were sold and you can actually still buy products today. Um, the main state prison is no longer in Thomaston um, it's moved to Warren, I believe, um, but there's still a shop there that makes um, primarily wooden wood products. Um, carpentry. I, re I remember when we were like choosing all these different sources and making the choices that, you know, just making sure that, that these were going to be interesting and engaging for students. And we were working with our, our two interns, Stella and um, Devin, and we were looking at this and it's such an odd image. At first, you don't know what it is. It's just like kind of a pattern, right? You're like, because, you know, who, who sees a carriage with ropes going down the street? But it allows um, the kids to really get deep into the detail. And you can see by using um, 
the, this online that you could get really um, zoom it out so, or zoom it in as you needed to kind of try to figure out what this is. So we really thought that something like this that's a little bit challenging, um, but it's really fun when they <laughs> kind of figure out what it is, um, was a better source than maybe some of the other ones that we were seeing. And of course, it has this guy here just kind of hanging out, um, mm -hmm. looking pretty pleased with himself. So it was it was pretty fun. And then, of course, the background is kind of curious as well. So, you know, there's all different directions that, that students could go with this. And, and yeah, there's a lot of intricacy in that in that image. And even the the way that they stack the rooms. So there it's like an alternating pattern almost. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, this just brings up all sorts of questions. I want to know what, what exactly is going on here, you know, especially in the background. You know, it looks like they have a building that was blown up and they have guys. And then the, some of these windows have curtains on them. There's just so many different directions. And that's one of the things that I get a kick out of is listening to the kids. They might not actually get on where they need to go as far as like figuring out exactly what's going on here, um, but it really does spur some creativity. And of course, those are, are ways of working with these sources as well as really getting them to, to think about what life was like at this time period um, and the, the creative imagination of, of what um, a city scene could look like at a given time. Yeah, absolutely. So connecting back to our prisoner of war story, we have um, a German POW picking potatoes up in Aristi County. Um, and this is a newspaper article. Actually, this is our one non-primary source. I know Heather and Allison and Joe, you're gonna gasp when you hear that we have a non-primary source, but this was a uh, Bangor Daily News article, um, uh, Franz Keller, was one of the POWs who tried to escape on those snowshoes. Um, and he came back decades later and gave a talk at, a, I think it was the local library. Um, and he was talking about his time um, at the, the prisoner of war camp at Spencer Lake. Um, so we included this in the labor theme because he's talking about harvesting timber with Canadians and cut ice from December to March. Um, and that was when he and the two other POWs planned their great escape, it says. So they were stockpiling food and, um, you know, all kinds of things, talking about how they made the um, snowshoes in this um, story, which talks about labor as well as life at the camp. And it was a really kind of a hard decision to make that you know, if we were going to put the second um, this is not a primary source, it's a, it's a secondary source in here, but it fits so well into the story. It really talked about labor. It gave, it gave them a, some, some really interesting things, but it also is, is it gives um, teachers and students an opportunity to talk about not just uh, primary sources, but what, what secondary sources can add. I mean, we, we wished she would have maybe just recorded his talk and, and, re, and we were able to get that, but we weren't. And the other sources weren't as strong. Um, so that I see that Joe's asking, would the students be able to determine that? Well, I think, you know, if it's since, especially since we included this in the nine to 12, depending on if, if they were working with, um, get, if the teacher, how well the teachers had prepped them for like, what is the difference between primary and secondary? But it's something that we definitely discuss afterwards in the label. So it's not that we just put, snuck it in there. We actually did give them a clue. Um, and it's, it, it's just something, to, to give them an added challenge, really. Yeah, actually, it occurs to me we could add in an optional activity that's okay, one of these is not a primary source, figure out which one it is. <laughs> yeah, to add on the layer. Because this, I mean, this caught me off guard too, because I was like, well, it, it was years after the event, but it's a first hand account, but it's written by somebody else, but she was talking about that man. Yeah, so I, you know. It is secondary, but it, it would be a great opportunity for students to dig into that, I agree. And the slide. All right, so um, I'm just going to go through uh, what we have in the first two themes, um, what kinds of people are in prison. I'm gonna know Whitney has to head out. Thank you, Whitney. All right, so um, for this theme, I'll run through quickly. We have got 
um, and, and Spectre's report from the Maine State Prison on female prisoners. So we haven't talked about women so far in our other sets yet, um, but the uh, it's kind of showing an internal complaint about how there isn't a dedicated space for female prisoners and how um, there needs to be a change for that. And then a table with the sentences for the different women in prison at the time. Um, we have another document for this unit, um, juvenile institutions and um, girls who were committed from different states. And then it breaks down uh, which cities and towns they came from um, and why they were committed. So this one we specifically put in the older group um, because we know, you know, some of these reasons they were committed is, is something that could be difficult to pull apart with your class, depending on age level, um, the ages of the girls. Um, this is both something that students could relate to, uh, and, you know, both by their age, um, because we're looking at, you know, 10 year olds, 15 year olds, 12 year olds coming into these institutions but also many town names that are going to be very familiar uh, to students in these classes across the state. We have um, an artifact here, um, a, a card that is giving the fingerprint and, and identification information for Austin McCormick. Um, there's a really interesting story behind the McCormick family that I'd encourage people to check out. Um, if they're going to use these materials with their class, but this would be someone coming into the main state prison um, and they're recording all of this identifying information about them. Um, this table shows the occupation of prisoners prior to their conviction. Um, so you can scroll through. Um, one thing that we pull out in the label is that the highest uh, number of folks on here are laborers. So it kind of gets people thinking about, well, okay, who can go? Um, who's likely to go into prison? You've got a broad range of bakers and candy makers and masons, um, but you might, might be more likely that people who aren't making as much money, um, we talk about what a laborer actually is at the time period, um, how that plays into it. Uh, another really interesting story to unpack in this unit um, comes from these two photographs here of Clifton Harris and Luther Verrill. Um, so let me zoom out a little bit so you can see. Um, these were cards that were distributed by the press of the time and kind of almost souvenir postcard styles. We have Clifton Harris, the West Auburn murderer. Um, so there's a story here about a murder that happened in Auburn, Maine. Um, Clifton Harris was uh, accused and ultimately sentenced for it, even though later evidence showed that it was very likely that Luther Verrill was the one responsible. Um, there is a story behind that. Obviously, race is a major factor in how that sentence ended up playing out, but it is a main story. Um, it connects to a lot of important themes for today, and they are two really powerful images for students to look at as well. These were both taken in a, a photograph um, in a photography studio. And if you look closely, they're actually wearing the same jacket. So these were props that were provided um, by the studio as well. And this is a difficult story for some. I mean, this, this is um, a story that is really, that we targeted for older students um, because it, it does involve them being sentenced and it does involve racism. Um, so it's something to, to challenge um, students, but it's also to be dealt with um, carefully. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, um, Clifton Harris did receive the death penalty too and was ex executed at the Maine State Prison. Uh, it was one of the few and one of the last um, people to, to be so, or because they, uh, capital punishment in Maine, you know, the laws changed afterwards and hopped back and forth a few times, um, but it was rare. And it's also a topic that's been in uh, kind of uh, has come up again and again as far as what's going on in the world in the United States across, across different states and, and federally. So it's very current. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see just for the heck of it if I can get this clip to work or if I need to figure out where it links these. 
I suppose it's doing a Google search, maybe. Weird. Well, I'm gonna have to check that out. I'm glad that I'm recording this today so that this won't, and these, won't, these materials just went online. So this is our chance to troubleshoot as well as walk through these. Um, but yeah, the last thing here is a uh, another audio clip. Um, so this is an interview um, with Bobby Paisant that was done for a local radio station and he is currently incarcerated at the Maine State Prison, um, has done a lot of volunteer work um, for hospice there and has a really fascinating story. So our audio clips, um, we made sure that they're all uh, between one and three minutes. It's not a huge amount for um, students to process. Um, the ones developed for the younger groups are only of like a minute and a half. Um, but these uh, are really for, you know, fascinating firsthand accounts. Okay, so that's what kinds of people are in prison. And then finally, I'm just going to give a quick overview of what we have in the life in prison theme, just to round things out today. Um, we have a, a riot baton, <laughs> a note, because we know students are so literal, sometimes they're going to get fill out their analysis worksheet with all the information about the measuring tape. <laughs> but this was the one photo we had access to while our, our collections are kind of in flux right now. Um, so this also has a connection to the McCormick family. Um, so that story is explored a little bit more in the label. Um, we have an image from the Maine State Archives um, of one of the cells of the Maine State Prison in the 1920s. So students can um, really dig into uh, what the experience of being there might have been like. Um, this is an excerpt from a speech that Austin McCormick gave. Um, he's the one whose fingerprints we saw earlier. And he is talking about um, being in the Maine State Prison and um, the, uh, let's see, the bed bugs and the cold and the food, he does not make it sound very good. Um, Austin McCormick eventually went on to have a career in prison reform. Um, he was a student at Bowdoin who voluntarily went undercover. He checked himself into the Maine State Prison as a forger and lived there to get a sense of what the conditions were like um, with someone on the inside. And he later traveled around different parts of the country and advocated for prison reform. Um, so his, his account is a really interesting one and he's a really interesting figure in Maine history as well. Um, this is a, a difficult artifact to include, but we thought it was important and one that can be very compelling for students. Um, the Maine State Museum received uh, in our collections, these um, grave markers. So they, uh, the Maine State Prison has a um, cemetery that was on site in Thomaston. Um, they sense, because these were falling apart, they replaced them with stone markers that are more permanent and a little bit more respectful as well. But um, these uh, wooden markers went to the prison, or to the prison, to the Maine State Museum. Um, so the students can get a sense of what the front and the back of these markers looked like. Um, they're painted wood, obviously not very well taken care of. And if you zoom in, you can get uh, um, the name J.W. Kerr died in 1890. So once they look at the labels, they will find that this is a young man who I believe he was sentenced for, he was on maybe the third uh, out of five years that he was sentenced when he um, was one of the victims of the tuberculosis pandemic. Um, so uh, this source, as well as this prison physician's report, um, talk about uh, sickness in prisons as well. So this was a 1919 discussion on influenza um, coming into the Maine State Prison. Uh, this is an artifact of tuberculosis. So. Um, that's another area for students to really be able to explore current events and issues as well as look into Maine's history. Uh, we have uh, kind of to provide another view of things, um, a picture of a baseball game happening at the Maine State Prison. Um, a lot of great details here for students to look at. 
This is another one of those, those pictures where we were choosing between different sources and really trying to find the source that isn't engaged students the most. And of course, there's a real contrast between, you know, America's favorite pastime being played out in a prison and, and then the, the environment, which is so kind of hulking and, and uh, threatening um, kind of in the background that you can't avoid. All right, and then our last source is another sound recording. I'm not even going to try to open the link this time because I know what will happen. But this is another clip of that Bobby Paisant um, article. And here he is talking about um, the experience of being in prison, what he missed out on. He talks about how he's received an education. Um, he's got an associate's degree and is getting his bachelor's, um, which is an opportunity that he's had at the main state prison. Um, and uh, talking about how it changes people, um, you know, what, what face they kind of put on uh, in the public eye and how they are viewed by, by people outside as well. But yeah, let's see, we're at 2.30 now. Um, I think I've gone through, in general, what you can find on our website. I am going to um, Sure, yeah, we've got, you can find this, it will be linked under the learn page on the Main State Museum website. Um, so you'll, you can go to learn um, and there'll be a unit on freedom and captivity there. And our primary source sets. Um, again, we'd encourage you to check out some of those additional resources if you'd like to um, you can scroll through here. And we wanna emphasize that we are always available for support um, this webinar that we're recording right now is going to pop up right into this empty space on the website um, as a guide to people who uh, want a start as they're working on this. Um, my email is here. You're welcome to contact me at any point. Um, you might think, well, this could work for my class, but I'm not sure about this element of it. I'm happy to give any advice. Um, and we also have our credits here to thank our interns and our partner organizations who contributed such great objects and photographs and documents. Um, and I think that's, that's all for me. I also should add that, you know, as we saw that, that this is brand new and we're, we're still trying out different sources and, you know, it's good things to learn, like that the, the links to, to the sound recordings need to be, um, uh, beefed up. <laughs> so uh, if, if there are people that start using this um, in their classrooms and they have comments, they, they have suggestions, um, there are things that they want to see in the future um, that we should, you know, reach out to us. Um, we're always kind of working and tweaking and making improvements and we're very anxious um, to make sure that these are workable sets that, that teachers are able to use um, to the and, and are successful in the classroom. So we really welcome your feedback. Great. Well, thank you, everybody.